Um, welcome back to the second day of the North American Jack and Lily's Garden Association Beautiful Conference. Um, we do have some new people joining us this morning, so welcome to your day one. Um, my name is Michelle, I'm the Executive Director for the Cave and Japanese Garden. Um, so today we're going to have some small little changes to the agenda due to the 70 kilometer hour winds, oh. which I guess I wore out everything I had planning yesterday, but today it just fell apart. So, but Lethbridge has to prove itself as a windy city, and it did so today. So, um, so the itinerary this morning is we're going to have our first two guest speakers, um, Wes and Robert. And then we'll take a break, because I know some of you would like to check out this morning as well, so there'll be a break. And then we welcome Ezard to the stage. We'll have our box lunch here, and then we'll walk over to the garden. Instead of the no dog tea, which is outside tea, we'll have inside tea. <laughs> and the one night demonstration will be inside the pavilion. And the stone setting has been nicely sheltered from Cody and Matt inside the garden to the corner. So, We'll split up the two groups, and then one will do the tea and the bonsai demonstration, and the other one will do the stone setting, and then we'll switch. So everyone will have some time away from the wind, and some will get the outdoor nature experience of Lethbridge. So thank you for working with us in our weather, weather team here. Um, as per yesterday, um, there were many requests that I bring the blueprints for the Kiyuko Japanese Garden and the detailed um, design. So they are sitting over there on that table. So during the break, if you'd like to get out to see the initial um, design and artwork of the Kiyuko, please do so. And so with that, we'll bring um, the second day to a start. So I'd like to introduce two gentlemen, um, Wes Naka and Robert Hirano. Uh, Robert Hirano is a registered architect in the provinces of Alberta and British Columbia, and has dedicated his career towards the conservation and understanding of historic places. With an extensive portfolio of conservation work that meets the standards and the guidelines for the conservation of historic places in Canada, he is often called upon by his peers in Canada and by professionals from other countries for guidance, consulting, and presentations in an international conferences for conservation and architecture. And for those who um, aren't aware, um, the Kiko Japanese Garden was named a municipal historic site in 2015. So I'm currently working with Robert to try to get our provincial designation. Wes Hiranaka is a licensed architect in the state of California and was introduced to conservation architecture on the UCLA campus through the seismic uh, corrections and improvement program for the original campus buildings and structures. Working in Canada, um, with, the, uh, with the firm RKH Architecture, he has built a strong understanding of the standards and guidelines of conservation of historic places in Canada and has had practical experience with the development and implementation of the restoration and preservation methods. And I also would like to extend that um, these gentlemen, and Robert especially, were the big team part of building that visitor center outside of the Kiko Japanese Garden. So please welcome. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I'm Wes Hiranaka, and I will be doing the introductory portion of this presentation. This presentation is going to focus on the conservation that has ongoing right now at the Japanese Garden. Um, before we start a conversation on conservation, you need to have a little bit of an understanding of the garden history, because that plays into the decision making that that happens. So the Japanese Canadian history in southern Alberta is, is quite long. Um, the first Japanese arrived in, in Canada in 1877. This photo actually is about 30 years later. It's my grandfather and his two nephews taken in about 1907-1908. The first Japanese arrived in Alberta in 1906. And in 1911, there was 244 Japanese living in the province of Alberta, many of them working on farms um, for the railways or in the mining. Um, with the Second World War and the bombing of, the, of Pearl Harbor, 
Um, the Japanese, people of Japanese descent were interned off the British Columbia coast and put into internment camps. And some of those in, internment camps were here in southern Alberta. Um, Canada, for the Americans that are out there, was a little bit different, whereas in the United States, they put all Japanese descendants into internment camps. In Canada, it was just the um, Japanese off the BC coast. So my grandparents, because they arrived and were here before, were never in internment camps. In 1949, Japanese got voting rights in Canada. So, and the generation, or my father's generation, the Niseis, they integrated into our Canadian mosaic as opposed to segregating themselves. And so, um, in 1964, um, two people, um, Reverend Karamura and Cleo Mowers. Reverend Karamura was a Buddhist minister in southern Alberta and Cleo Mowers is, was the editor of the Lethbridge Herald. And they both simultaneously had the idea to build a Japanese garden to celebrate the Japanese culture that was here and also to share the Japanese culture that was here. So um, the meeting of the two was put together by a Kurt Steiner. He was the director of the Travel and Convention Bureau here in Lethbridge. And so with their meeting, the idea to build a Japanese garden was born. They formed a committee, a steering committee, to um, pursue it. The steering committee took it to the city of Lethbridge. The city of Lethbridge had accepted the idea. They formed a society, the Lethbridge and District um, Japanese Garden Society. And from there, they went on to um, find a Japanese Garden, garden architect, Dr. Kubo, was designing a Japanese garden in San Diego, they had heard. And they requested that the mayor then go down to San Diego to meet with him. And they brought Dr. Kubo up to Lethbridge and he looked at a number of sites. And when he got to the current site where it is, he said, this is the site. And he made a couple of statements there um, that... I will go through later here. I'm just reading my notes. I apologize. Um, and, but Dr. Kubo went back to Japan and made it a class project. And so his students came up with the design. And the current garden is based on one of those designs of his students. So I'm going to take a short break from this history portion and go into what we call the standards and guidelines. As Michelle had mentioned, left the Japanese garden is now designated as a municipal site. And so there are docu documents and guidelines of which we need to follow now to preserve the integrity of the garden. And so this is a statement, Canada's historic places are living legacies for all Canadians. And that's one of the guiding principles of the standards and guidelines. The standards and guidelines are issued by Parks Canada. There are three key definitions um, in the standards and guidelines. A historic place, that is a place, a building, a group of buildings, a site, an archaeological site that have what they call a heritage value, whether that's a through aesthetics, materials, events that have happened there. There's a number of criteria that it gives it its value. The character defining elements are those that elements of that place that express this heritage value. So with all of that, a statement of significance is, is created. The state, statement of its significance outlines the description of the place, it explains the heritage value, it describes and lists all the character defining elements, it lists significant dates, and as well as it gives a statement of integrity. And the statement of integrity being the current conditions largely. So the Japanese garden, the Nikayuko, um, 
when Dr. Kubel came, he said it was a garden needs to reflect the ideas of a culture that nurtures it. So that becomes an important portion of that description of what this, what this is. It, it describes the design concept. And he said that this would be a Canadian garden in a Japanese style. As we went through and Robert and I wrote the statement of significance for the Niku Yuko Japanese garden, um, we did, there's a number of research. You look at historic photos and drawings. And one of the first things that we discovered was that the drawings are measured in shaku, which is, and now I, ha now I have an Asian, Asian professor here. <laughs> shaku is, would be the Japanese equivalent of the foot. It, it, was, it is based on the emperor's foot. Just so you know, royals have large feet. <laughs> <laughs> Um, part of the heritage value that exists with the Japanese garden, and I, I could be very proud of this because of my father's involvement with this, was the community support to build this garden. It, while the garden, the idea was initially to celebrate the Japanese culture and to, to present it and show it and share it, the whole community got behind this. This, this was not a project just of the Japanese community. It's far from it. And so they had rock picking. That is not me. I was a little bit older. I did go out and pick flat rocks. <laughs> the instructions were pick skipping stones. <laughs> and so they worked with local contractors. And uh, so that is a large part of the heritage value of the Nika Yuko beyond the physical and the aesthetic portion of it. The garden has many character defining elements. Um, from the Shakai, which is the borrowed view, to the, pavil the tea pavilion, the wood structures, um, the lanterns, it, 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 the list goes on. There's many what they would consider to be character defining elements. And that's important because those are the points at which we focus our conservation on. They are the things that express the integrity of the garden. And so um, I'm going to hand this over to Robert because Robert is, is the expert on conservation. And so he will talk about the condition and the integrity of our materials that we have. My background is in conservation architecture. And my background history is a little bit different. I was born and raised in Toronto. And my parents were interned in, uh, in inner BC. And then after the war, they were allowed to go to, uh, they couldn't go back to the coast. They had to go someplace else. So my parents ended up in Fort William for two years. And then after that, then they, they were allowed to move again. And and so they chose to move to Toronto, and they couldn't uh, go to places where they were uh, uh, beside each other relatives. So they wanted us to, to integrate, so uh, we ended up on the street, and my grandparents were on the avenue, which filled the criteria. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then how I came west was I did my master's at the University of Calgary and just found my way down to Lethbridge after Peter Lougheed had the province going very, very well, so I wasn't about to go back. So, and uh, I've been working on the garden for 20 plus years, just working on the maintenance of, of the structures. Um, and about five years ago, we started to, to uh, uh, do some work uh, on a study for the conservation of the structures because we knew the 50th was, was coming up. So that was the big push for it. And then what I did was a, a condition study. We looked at the structure. We looked at the materials, especially the wood. 
and uh, the construction details and how we might improve those construction details um, because uh, the buildings were actually built in Japan. All the structures were built in Japan. They were crated and then shipped to Canada and built here. So the, uh, um, when we also did that, we had to, to consider the conformance to the standards and guidelines. So that was one of the key things. And if you look at, at the condition, you can see what's happening to the wood now. You can, oh, I did that wrong. Okay, there. You can see that it's starting to break down. It's, uh, it's a cypress wood. Hinoki is a cypress. Um, when we started to, to do the, the, uh, um, the reconstruction of some of the items of the replacement, you can see the structure here. We, uh, we started to, uh, to look at Hinoki and the only place we could find, we could find some in Taiwan, but then we found a, a source in Oregon. So we, we, it's the same species, they call it Port Orford Yellow Cedar. So that's what we, we replace with. Because the standards and guidelines talk about replacing the materials in kind. So one of the things that when, the, when they design the structure in, in uh, Japan, you can see that um, here, they actually didn't consider the, the climate here. So it's a dry climate where we live in an arid area. We have a lot of wind as you're gonna to experience today. Um, we have snow, uh, we have freeze thaw conditions during the winter, be, and mainly due to, to our Chinook winds. So that really creates havoc on, on, on a wood that likes moisture. So, the effects we had to deal with. We, uh, and I should point out that, that here, to be aware that you can see the foundations here, but that's actually built on 30 feet of engineered fill because the water line, the actual water, oops, I gotta go back. The actual water, uh, this thing's pretty sensitive. Man. The actual grade was way down and we couldn't get uh, the stability. So all the way back, when you go to the uh, the visitor center today, all of the soil that's there is all all fill, and and every structure we put on there, we've had to struggle with. So you can you can get a sense of that that heavy timber, but not for a Canadian climate. And then you know our winter. Canadian winters can be pretty brutal here, so. Um, and especially in the spring when we get that heavy, wet snow, that was the issue that we were having. So about 20, 20 plus years, in the 80s, uh, we, uh, we developed a temporary reinforcement. You can see them, the angled pieces here. Those are there because the roof was starting to sag and pull away from the building. So we, we uh, developed a system to, uh, to keep those roofs in place. And here you can see it on the bell tower very clearly, the angled pieces there. Um, and every, every fall they're put up and every spring they come down. They need replacing because they're getting old too, but <laughs> <laughs> they've done, They've, they've done their job. Yeah, those are just the volume of snow that could arrive. Uh, uh, which does arrive. <laughs> and there it is without the, without the, the temporary structure. The pavilion is what mainly I'm going to talk about. I started with the, with the structure. You can see that, that because of the high water table here, you can see that the, this, these are concrete 
pads put down, but you can see the rising dam coming up and starting to rot away the edges. We ended up putting a, a steel shoe around the outside to reinforce those. Um, and uh, actually, we, we've actually added some ventilation through there so we can get some natural ventilation to keep, keep the timbers dry at, right at the ground level. In the roof, we, there is some insulation up there. It, there's actually no insulation in the walls. Um, our structure was suffering um, as you, well, this is just natural drying uh, cracks, but there's other locations where we had some severe structural problems. So we, we ended up either sistering pieces to reinforce or we would put uh, metal connectors on. So those were, were added as well at, on the roof structure. Our windows, originally the windows were, were um, single pane. They're sliding window. Uh, you can see the, the wooden tracks where the sliders would have been. And they just wore out over time and you you can see on the outside how much rot was happening on there. In fact, the wind here, uh, when we did the gate, uh, you'll see when you go to the, to, to the gate to the pavilion, it's been redone. But when we first got to it, the wind had blown so, so hard on it, I could take the grain and peel the grain off because it had sandblasted it so badly. So, and uh, so that's the kind of stuff the standards and guidelines talk about us trying to keep the integrity of the original material there, but sometimes you don't have a choice. So in this case, we had to make a, a real hard choice about, uh, of what, about what to do. And uh, we, uh, you can see that, that we did replace them. We used uh, newer details. You can see that the copper flashing on here, which didn't exist before. And that was creating problems with a lot of the materials down below. As you saw earlier, some of the siding was, was starting to, to come apart. Now that siding is just a quarter inch composite wood. And it's, it's coated with a, a sanded paint material. So, we had some issues with that too. And, and as we went along, you'll see what we did. Here it is there. You can see that it was, it was coming off the roof here and, and just making issues for us. It was starting to degrade to the point where, where we couldn't save the original material. So what we chose to do and is to uh, encapsulate the original material. So we found a, a, a new modern board, a composite board that, that is very thin. We, we placed it on there. We put a, a sand paint finish on top of it. And in the future, if, if uh, uh, technology comes along and says, gee, we, we could have actually repaired that, well, we've left it in place. So we, when we had the opportunity we, we leave that behind. And then the shoji screens, they were an interesting piece for us. They, uh, uh, you can see that they were handcrafted, all the little handcrafted lock, locking pieces that, and quarter pieces that held them together. They originally, and, and in Japan you'd see them, they'd be paper, but here it's just, wasn't going to work. So they had put up a, a polycarbonate piece on there. And of course, polycarbonate turns yellow in the sun. So over the years, it had turned yellow. It, it, it got very brittle. So what we chose is we found this, this acrylic material in Japan. And it has, and when you go into the, the building, you will see that it, it it's, has this paper look to it. And that's what they're using there. So a little bit of research we found found a product that satisfied what we, we uh, uh, felt was a good solution. Now, in this case, we didn't save the polycarbonate. I mean, it was so brittle, it was so worn, there, there's no use in, 
and just because it was original material, it, it some things you just have to say that it, it's never going to be used again. Um, the bridges were were our, our last big venture. Now, the bridges because of the 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 Hinoki there and it, it being almost 50 years old, the wood was in, in very tough condition. And structurally, you could see that, uh, that the wood was almost beyond saving, how rotted it is here, how, how the, it's, uh, it's structurally unsound. So we were gonna try and, and, and originally knit some some wood to it. We ha we had purchased this this uh, uh, Port Orford yellow cedar. We had we had brought it to Lethbridge. Uh, we had it in a container for about 18 months because I wanted to see the wood acclimatize, uh, not only to to the uh, humidity conditions, but also because it's coming from from sea level. So and I didn't take the bind the binding off it, otherwise it would have turned into pretzels for us. So that's what we did. And uh, we were originally going to, to see if we could join the wood together with scarf joints and, and all of that. But it, it just became to the point where the wood was not structurally sound enough to take the loads that we needed. So uh, we've saved what we could of the, the old wood but uh, in the end, we, we did rebuild. We used all of the, the, the metal pieces that were there before. We, we uh, refurbished them and reinstalled them. And there's the bridges. And we did a complete documentation of it. We measured it. We made sure everything was, was in the right slopes. Uh, uh, we had a, uh, a carpenter, which, who unfortunately just recently died, um, who is meticulous about doing this. Uh, he just made it one of his, his great contributions to the garden. And the bell tower, the bell tower had, had its own issues. Um, the uh, concrete was breaking up, oops, again this one is a little bit, was breaking up on the top here. The stones were coming off, the edge stones were we're also uh, loose, so we had to, to attend to that. Now, one of the interesting things about this is the bell tower, the structure, it is, it, it's held together because of the tension that the bell, the weight of the bell holds it together, so it locks it in. So we had to be very careful about not releasing that structure. So what we did was, we put this, this metal tie around the outside to hold it so we didn't get a racking of, of the structure on it. And here, so you can see the demolition as we pulled, pulled it up. And there you can see, you know, there was the original. And then the stones here, and, and we remortared all of those and reset them. But we documented them, we had them numbered, and everything was replaced where, where it was before. And the Okame, the Okame were a surprise for us. While we sort of knew they were there, there's only, was originally only one access to it. Now upstairs there's a little access door, you could stick your head up and, and that was it. You couldn't physically get under the beam to get up there. So I could see some paper hanging there, but I couldn't see the mask. And then when we had to get up there to assess the structure, we cut a hole. And that's when we, we found the Okame. And the story be kind of behind Okame, um, I'll just give the short version. She was the wife of a master builder. He was uh, in Japan. He was building a temple there. And uh, during the construction, she noticed that there was an issue with the structure. The columns were too short. So she told him, she also it suggested he could add some brackets to, to do this and saved his reputation. 
So, uh, unfortunately, she died before the finish of the temple. But uh, in her honor, the, I guess the, the, uh, the uh, workers installed her, uh, uh, an image. And, and that has become a tradition now. Uh, she's, uh, it's similar to what we do in North America when, when you do uh, a construction of the steel structure on a building, you'll see a flag go up. So it's a loose connection, but you know, to them it, it, it was, and to us it was just fascinating. When we found them, it was just wow. And there they are in their original location. Um, they put a, they, this board lists the contractor and, and uh, it, it's quite, quite nice. Everything now is back in, in place. Um, we did some research. Uh, here you can see the original dedication of the of Okame uh, to, to there. Once we, before we put it back, uh, well, here, you can see that when we took them down, we had people from the, from the archives come over, and then they, they did the, uh, the preservation of, of, the, of the Okami and, uh, and recorded them. Um, and then we, we had uh, it rededicated, and then I placed them back. And then in the future, where are we going now? We have the Moon Bridge, which is, it, it was suffering. We, we tightened up a lot of the tension members, and you'll see them on, on top of the, of the post when you go over there. They, they, they hold it to the steel structure underneath, and we tighten those up, we reinforce those. But the wood, it still has, has issues. Um, to that end, we still have our sea can full of, of yellow cedar, which is the most expensive wood we ever have purchased. <laughs> but uh, it's there, and, and that's our intent at one point to, to do that. Uh, there are some other little items you'll see around. We've got a program to do it over, over time. The big thing was to, to hit the, the 50th. Uh, and of course, 2017 is Canada's 150th. So we're focusing on that as well. Uh, it's nice that six, they were both constructed in 67, so it, it makes a, uh, a joint celebration. Um, originally, when uh, uh, Lester B. Pearson, uh, he was our prime minister at the time, and this is Frank Sherry, he was the mayor at the time, but uh, Lester B. had that, that great comment. And the fact that, that uh, uh, this is not only multicultural, but uh, a celebration of the fact that, that uh, this community chose to, to acknowledge and recognize the contributions of Japanese Canadians to this, uh, to this area. And of course, originally uh, we had uh, Japanese royalty come and, uh, and, and open it. And then at the 20, 25th, they came back. And we're keeping our fingers crossed that they'll be back for the 50th. So next July, <laughs> if you want to see the garden in, in its glory, it, that should be a, an interesting time. Um, this is the garden as it existed originally in 67, and hopefully, is it, is it gonna come? Is it gonna come up? It's not coming, it's on the next slide. Okay, and there it is now. So, there's a, from the same view, that's how, how a, a garden grows. Thank you very much.
there any other selection of wood other than the, uh, the hinoki at all used? We had, uh, we had looked at, uh, because there's lots of fur around here and it is stronger, we had, we had looked at that, but in the end we, we decided that the, that the standards and guidelines were, were dictating that we find something very similar. Because the aesthetics didn't match and it was... Exactly, the grain, and, and as we go through the maintenance of it, what we're doing now is we're adding boiled linseed oil to it to extend the life. I know there's other uh, uh, products like the Bear products, uh, but we, we're going back to, to originals and we'll hopefully that the boiled linseed oil will be able to, to extend the life of that. Uh, we also had, at way back, had purchased some, some yellow cedar from BC and there's a couple of areas that, that have that as well. And that's when we, dis, we started to look at, yeah, it's performing well enough, maybe we should stick with the, with the same species. And the grain matched. It, it does, and it's the clearest wood. And if you work with yellow cedar, when you put a saw through it, it has this awful smell. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always use the wood in the Japanese garden as, it's because it's such an excellent way to describe conservation architecture because part of the conservation is the integrity of the original and the light materials and you use the garden and say for one of the characters you find in there and elements that is unique to this is that these structures were designed, built in Japan, disassembled, put into crates, brought over to Blackbridge with the craftsmen, and those craftsmen together with the Southern Alberta community rebuilt them. That, that's part of its heritage value. So they came over with this Hinoki. Logic would say that when you replace it, you not replace it with the Hinoki because it doesn't perform well in the Canadian climate. And so you should be using a Doug, Douglas fir or a larch or something, which has proven it lasts stands the test of times in hundreds of years. But now you have compromised the original. And so you have compromised this heritage value of this event of it being built in Japan, being brought over and reconstructed. So it, it's that decision making that we have to go through in, with the conservation is, is very fast. And so the identification of a, a similar material that will last a little bit longer was important. Uh, how was the structure fastened together? Did they use nails or... They it? have some fasteners, but basic Japanese joinery. You know, mortise and tenon, oh. interlocking joints, I mean, the, the fascinating stuff. That, uh, we, we ended up getting books and books on Japanese joinery because as we went through it, we were discovering, oh, this is how that was done because a lot of it is blind. And when you get to go over there and look at the Azamaya, the Azamaya is just a wonderful piece of structure. We haven't touched it. it, it, it it's lived on its own and it's so well constructed and, and the, the, I would call it a poetry of, of structure because as it weaves itself together as a, as a piece of, uh, of structure is, is just marvelous. We, we had a timber expert come um, visit the garden to look at the, actually he was here on another wood timber project, but we took him over to the Japanese garden to, to have him look at the wood. And he got to the Azamaya and he started he started rubbing it, <laughs> and he says the oil in your hand will protect the wood, and that that they and that the people actually will do that. And so here he was, he, to him the, the Azamai was such an excellent example of the timber construction that he just felt compelled that he needed to help preserve it. <laughs> <laughs> I think, Robert, uh, when you mentioned about the yellow cedar, I think that 
the first project we did was the deck. It, uh, it, it, the cedar, and I think when you look at it today, it, it's certainly different from the bridge. The bridges stand out because they're new, but I think the deck is maybe 20 years now or 15 years now. Oh, I, yeah, it's got to be over 20 now. Yeah. Yeah. So and if you could, I mean, if you didn't know uh, that we'd done it, I don't think you would know that the wind would change to yellow cedar. It, and it's an interesting point because, you know, for me as a conservation architect, I had, you know, as you go, you learn stuff. One of the things that we we learned, and that was about about keeping the bindings on the on the wood, because we had some issues on that, and you can't see what we did, but it, and I, I'm not sure <laughs> Rick wants me to admit this, but at the end of the wood, it started to to split. So what we did was, was uh, and you can't see it because the decking is, we, we, we put little tension members at the ends of it. So we, we bolted it back together and it's held it together really quite nicely. Otherwise, the decking would have split. And, and that's the thing about acclimatizing your wood. And, and also when you, don't always believe what, when they say, oh yeah, it's kiln dried. <laughs> now I have a tool that goes along and I measure it. Okay, is it 8%, is it 10%? I know now. But in those days, you just trusted what was on the, on the labels. And when it got here, it was way too green. <laughs> Going back to your question on the construction and the jointery and everything. Because I was a, wasn't very old when they were building this, I remember watching the workers as they were putting in the wedges and, the, and their parts. And they had a mallet that was about this round, it's about this long. You know, a very long, thin handle, and it was all wood. And they would stand there and tap, and tap, and tap, until it finally went into place. As opposed to the way we would do it here, we would get a steel sledgehammer in one hit and it would be in place. Right. So there, there is, there is a distinct difference in how this structure is built, and I'm doing it to repair it. Is a significant job. Um, how do you deal with obviously a heritage of this age and uh, that rustic beauty, and still? Good question, Cody. Um, it's all about, you know, the standards and guidelines talk about being able to see the history. So when, when I started in conservation, well, I've been working at it for 35 years, but in those days, they, we tried to make sure that everything looked the same. Now they want the, the philosophy is you want to see the transitions. So when we do stuff like that, there was a lot of, of uh, gnashing of teeth as, as we made the decision to replace those bridges. They will turn the, that silvery gray in about two years, uh, but they're going, it's the garden going through transition. It, it's, we compare it to, to when, when Mass came over and said, take down that Mugo pine. Like, that thing had been there for, since day one. But it, it I guess it, it was, in his mind, the aesthetics were, were gone from it, and he wanted, he needed a change. So that's a conscious decision. What, how we approach it is, as long as we've documented everything, we've made sure that, that before we touch it, we make sure that this is the con condition. We record it to say, here's, here's what the conditions were, and here's why we decided not to do it. Um, now, one of the things that we do do, and, and, and that's the thing about adding the, uh, the uh, preservatives on it, like a, a linseed oil, we'll keep it in that, that 
uh, newer look for a longer time, but will extend the life or you know, another where this would barely made it to 25, I should be able to get 30 or 40 years out of it. I mean, I won't be around to see it, but that's, that's our intent. And uh, it's all up to, to whoever the, the conservationists are at, at that time. They have to recognize that, that uh, the philosophies and the materials and, and the technology that, that we use was here and now, but in the future, you know, they might have all sorts of marvelous stuff. That's why we saved some of the wood, because we wanted some of that to, to be around so that they could say, okay, where did this wood come from? So, yeah, we, we've got some archived, and, and you know, they might be able to, to go back and say, it grew in this stand of forest. That might have significance. I'm not sure. But it, it's leaving the legacy uh, for, for others to follow. So the work that has been done, you think that will maybe get you 30 years down the road or, or longer, and you're not totally sure it looks like some of the flashings and whatnot that were not added originally should eliminate some of the... Yeah, the, we, had, we have new technology and, and we should use it and the standards and guidelines say yes, use it where, where it needs to be because a lot of times People didn't know if you. Canada is a young country, and if we find buildings uh, that are a hundred years old, that's great for us. But you got to remember, people were bringing Europeans were bringing te techniques over from from their countries and using them here. Well, now we we now look at it and say, well, that won't work anymore. So we made conscious decisions not to put bag technology back into the buildings. We change them. As long as they're, they're, they're hidden or they're, they're, there's conscious decisions to, to do it and the reasons why. Uh, because it's a historic site, we're required to answer to, uh, to the different governing authorities all the time. So I always have a, a heritage advisor, whether they're national or provincial or uh, municipal, who I have to justify to them. And uh, when I put my documents out, I explain to them why we're doing certain things. And, and they either say yes or no. And we have several discussions about them. And, and I'm, I'm always going to the, uh, I belong to the uh, uh, Association for Preservation Technology International. So I go to the conferences and I have great discussions over a couple of beers with my, with my colleagues over the, the new philosophies, the new materials, the new technology. Uh, and the philosophy has changed, for sure. And, and, and I've enjoyed that change because I understand why it was going in, in, in that direction and, and uh, uh, when the standards and guidelines came out because they're only about 15 years old in Canada. The U.S. has had theirs a little bit longer, but before that we were dealing with, with charters. The Venice Charter, the Athens Charter, uh, they were our, our basic direction for, for conservation. Uh, yeah, the province has, has matching grants and, and um, you make your applications. Of course, like everything, it's underfunded, but uh, uh, what the municipal grants are, are about is, is the province comes from the same pot of money, the Alberta Historic Resources Foundation and they have about only $5 million to give out. Um, and they give uh, municipalities, if they have, a, if they have a, a, a Main Street program or, or a, uh, some sort of joint heritage program, they will give them $50,000 and say, okay, you use it as you wish. And uh, I'm not, I can't remember exactly 
how much money was given to this one. So are the, the standards, are they uh, across the levels of governance, so municipal, provincial, national, are the standards the same or are they, or are they complementary or? No, they're the same. They're all the we, same. We've now accepted one so standards if you, meet, if you meet the municipal ones, you're, you're feeding eventually into the provincial ones. Well, not necessarily, because no. you'd have to remember that I'm dealing with three levels of government yeah. and, and a, a federal person might say, uh, because the, the character defining elements and the heritage values will be more important in some levels to, to a national person than they will be to a municipal person. So they always pick on what they want the most and then we prioritize them accordingly and then I negotiate them is what I do. So the standards are accepted but the emphasis may change? With they may with individual. So uh, over the years what I've, uh, I've done is I, I've managed to, to create a relationship with all levels of government so I, I get what each individual's interests are. The, st the standards and guidelines were written and issued by Parks Canada. And then um, the provincial authorities or jurisdictions accepted those and followed that. And then likewise, so did the munici municipalities do that as well. And so we are all following standards and guidelines for the conservation of historic places in Canada that is issue, that has been issued by Park Canada. It is all in, in the same set of standards and guidelines. Yes. And some of it is very prescriptive, some of it is just descriptive in trying to express a philosophy or an approach and not be very exactly specific because every every case is yeah, and that's interesting because I was involved in, in writing the standards and guidelines, going through the reviews, so that's why the approach became more looser because we wanted to, to be able to have different jurisdictions apply their, their criteria. Okay, great. Thank you very much. <laughs>